When Jesus looks at people, he knows if they're saved or lost. If Jesus stood in front of every one of us, he would know right away if we're born again and saved or if we're just a nice religious lost person. How many here have ever owned sheep? You've owned sheep. Put up your hand, don't be shy. I think I saw one hand. How about goats? Anyone ever own a goat? One, two, three, okay. Well, you wonderful people know something that the rest of us don't know what it's like to live with these things. And uh, they're quite something. Um, if I were to ask you, where do sheep come from? What would you answer? Well, let's try this again. Where do sheep come from? It's not a trick question. Where do sheep come from? From other sheep. Yeah, you got it. I knew you knew. All right. Where do goats come from? From other goats. Yeah. Well, if I were to ask you, where do saved people come from? Because we know that in the world today there are saved people and lost people. Saved people are on their way to heaven. Lost people are on their way to hell. Where do saved people come from? Well, spiritually speaking, the Lord Jesus made a comparison between saved people and sheep. And he made a comparison between unsaved people and goats. And so if saved people are like spiritual sheep, and unsaved people are like spiritual goats, then where do these spiritual sheep come from? Any thoughts? What does it sound like? It might be the answer. It sort of sounds like the spiritual sheep come from the spiritual goats. That's interesting, isn't it? If you are saved today, if you're born again, you're saved, then you are one of God's sheep. You used to be one of the devil's goats, but at some point you got born again and you became a new creature in Christ. You went from being a goat to a sheep. The... Uh, the Lord Jesus one day is going to separate the sheep and the goats. In Matthew 25, you, you have that. And he says here in verse 32, after he sit on his throne here, and before him shall be gathered all nations. This is the sheep and goats judgment. And uh, it's a reference here to the great white throne. You can read it later in Revelation chapter 20. All of the world's nations will be gathered before him. And in uh, everyday life, a lot of uh, sheep and goat farmers, they let the sheep and the goats just intermingle. They seem to get along just fine. We have that picture of the... There, can you see that all right? Now there's the, the farmer, and behind him is a huge flock of sheep and goats. They get all in there and they mingle together. And at one point, the Lord Jesus is going to sit down and separate the sheep from the goats. Now, a good shepherd can do that. He can separate the sheep from the goats because he knows them, he lives with them, he can tell them apart. Uh, do you have that second photo? Put that up. No, not that one, no. The other one. The other second photo. There, that one. What is that? A sheep or a goat? It looks like a goat, doesn't it? It's actually a, a longhorn sheep. So, you see what I'm saying? Sometimes it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell the difference. Let me ask you this question. If you're born again, you're one of God's sheep, but can people tell the difference between you and your unsaved next door neighbor? Is there a difference can people look at you and say, oh, this person is one of God's? That's a good question, isn't it? 
Now the shepherd can tell the difference between the sheep and the goats. And of course, the great shepherd, Jesus, he knows exactly who's saved and he knows exactly who's not saved. He knows. For us, it's a bit of a guesswork at times. But you know what? When you hide your light under a bushel and don't let people know you're a Christian, you're making a big mistake. Big mistake. You need to let your light shine for Jesus so that others will see you and be able to glorify God for the good works in your life. And so we're going to learn today about the sheep and the goats. And we're going to get into a little bit of theology. Okay, a little bit of theology. I think you'll find it interesting. Let's have a word of prayer first. Our Heavenly Father, before we go further, we want to ask your blessing on this message. Now, dear Father, I ask that you would give me sufficient power in my voice so that I can preach this. It's a, a good truth. Lord, you've said in the Bible, how shall they hear without a preacher? Father, if the preacher has lost his voice, then the people still can't hear. And so, please, give me enough voice. Give us all good ears to hear and good hearts to receive the Word of God today. And if there be anyone here today who is not yet born again, maybe they're a real nice person, maybe a wonderful person. Maybe they even attend church and maybe read the Bible and pray at times, but they've never yet been truly born again. They've never been honest before you with their sin. Help them today. Oh, Heavenly Father, please give them faith to be saved. And we'll thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. All right. Uh, Pastor Ivan, you're behind the controls there. Put up that, that third photo that you thought was the second photo. That's the one we want. And so that's pretty easy to tell the difference there, isn't it? between the sheep and the goat, especially when we mark it for you, right? Wouldn't that be something if every saved person in the world had that somehow blazoned on them, saved, and every unsaved person in the world had unsaved on them? It would be very easy to tell the sheep from the goats, wouldn't it? Hmm? No one would have any problem at all. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way, does it? All we, all we have really is what we see in other people's lives. Do we see Jesus in your life? You go to church, great. You read the Bible, great. You pray, great. But is Jesus Christ inside of you? That's the key question. And so anyhow, talking about goats here, I want to point out some differences between sheep and goats. Now, a few of you raised your hand earlier, so you will know some of this. Um, as far as goats go, they say there are six basic different species of goat, such as a long-haired goat, a short-haired goat, a mountain goat. You know, we have the expression in English, don't get my goat. Ever heard that one? All right, well, we won't go there. But the male goat, what is the name of a male goat? It's called, it starts with the letter B, a billy, a billy goat. That's the male goat. Now, what is the female called? Starts with the letter N. A nanny. Someone said it, I think. A nanny. That's the female. All right. Now, you all should know this. What do they call the baby goat? Starts with the letter K. A kid. Yeah. All right. And so we can have some fun with that, but we won't. Now, goats are very smart. They're very intelligent. A couple of you that raised your hand saying that you've had goats, you'd know this. Researchers over in London, England at um, uh, Queen Mary University, they tried a few years ago to figure out just how smart goats are. And so they designed uh, a puzzle. There was some fruit inside a box which could only be reached by solving the puzzle. In this case, the goats had to use their teeth to pull on a rope to activate a lever, and then they had to use their muzzle to move the lever, and then out would pop 
some food and they'd get a reward. So they chose 12 goats. This I'm not making this up. True story. They chose 12 goats. And of those 12, nine goats were able to master the task after four attempts. Of the three goats that failed, two tried to take a shortcut using their horns to pry open the box. And so eh, they got disqualified. And then the twelfth goat tried and tried and showed no sign of improvement by her 22nd attempt. And so they wrote her off as a hopeless case. Now, after identifying the nine winning goats, the researchers waited for 10 months, almost a whole year, and they brought the goats back and presented the same animals with the same box and the same uh, puzzle to see how long it would take them to recrack the, the, the code. And all of the goats remembered how to solve the problem and were able to access the food in less than a minute. Goats are smart. There's a humorous story about a farmer who had a, a goat that was just too smart for its own britches. And this goat was get, opening gates, opening doors, and getting into things and causing trouble. And so the farmer decided, all right, you're out of here, fella. So he put the goat in the back of his truck. And he drove to the next town, and he dumped the goat there. And got back in his truck, drove home. By the time he got out of his truck, he looked and he saw the goat was back at his house. Got there before him. What? And so the next day, he took the goat, put it in the back of his truck, and he drove 50 miles away into the country. And he dropped off the goat. And then he got back in his truck and hit the gas. When he got home, there was the goat waiting for him. He was fit to be tied. This crazy goat's got to go. And so the next day, he threw the goat in the back of the truck, and he drove 150 miles clean across the country, and he dropped the goat off. About six hours later, uh, he rings up his wife, the farmer's wife, at home on the farm. The farmer's wife picks up the phone, and he says, yeah, it's me. He says, is that miserable goat anywhere? And she says, yes, he's right here. Why? Why do you ask? He says, put him on the phone. <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> so I thought it was cute. Cute little farmer and a goat joke, I thought. Anyhow, uh, goats really are smart. And they're curious. And goats can be moody. And goats can be aggressive. And they'll defend themselves with their horns, and they'll also bite. They say goats will eat almost anything except cardboard and tin cans. That's what they say. And they say that goats are good climbers, and they tend usually to stay sort of separated from one another, although they can be herded together. Now, we're going to contrast that with the sheep. Put the picture back up just so that we all remember what a goat looks like and what a sheep looks like. You know, interesting, I read a, a report by one of these uh, so-called scientific researchers, and they believed that five million years ago, uh, goats and sheep were kind of one breed, and they kind of evolved into separate, you know, breeds. And I read that, and I thought, well, wait a minute, what about back in Genesis? You know, where uh, you have um, Cain and Abel. That's right back at the beginning of creation. You got Cain and Abel, and Abel took one of the sheep. So there was definitely a separation back then. Anyhow, it was just a thought. But we're going to talk about sheep now for a moment. And um, whereas there are six basic types of goats, apparently there are more than a thousand basic types of sheep. That's something. Now, does anyone know what the grown-up male sheep is called? What's it called? What? It starts with the letter R. Ram. A ram, yeah. You've seen those trucks called a ram? Now you know what they are. 
And they're just the growing up sheep. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, the female growing up sheep, what is she called? A U, E W E. A U. I don't know of any car called a U. Maybe you do, but I don't. And all right, what is the baby sheep called? A lamb. Everyone knows that one, right? Okay, we got that straight. Now, sheep. Sheep intelligence ranges from dumb to moderate. You know, that's how smart sheep are. Basically, they're, you know, dumb, dumb dumbs is what they are, basically. There's an interesting story about a cowboy who, um, uh, he was looking after a bunch of sheep, and everyone knows how dumb sheep are, and the cowboy lost his Bible. He couldn't find it anywhere. And the next day, a sheep brings the Bible back and b gives it to the cowboy. There's the cowboy's Bible, and, and the, the cowboy said, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. And the sheep said, well, it's not really a miracle. Your name was in the front cover. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> Look at all the things you've learned about goats and about sheep here. But they are kind of dumb. They tend to be gentle, sensitive, and emotional creatures. You see the difference between sheep and goats already? Sheep like to gather together, whereas goats tend not to. Sheep are followers. When one moves, the other will follow. There's a story about these two guys talking, and one guy says to the other, if you had 25 sheep in a sheep pen and one sheep jumps over, how many have you got left? And the other guy says, well, that's simple. It's 24. And the first guy says, no, you're wrong. He said... To, he said to his friend, he said, uh, you may know mathematics, but you don't know sheep. Because if one jumps over, they'll all jump over. And that's very true about sheep. And uh, they don't seem to learn any lesson. They could be, you know, like jumping off a cliff just about. And, yeah, let's all jump off the cliff. They follow. They're, they're very much followers that way. They tend not to defend themselves. They, they're not like the, the billy goats and so on. They tend not to defend themselves. They would sooner run scared than stay and fight. Now, there's always the exception, but as a rule of thumb. Um, now, what do sheep eat? Apparently, they eat mainly grass and clover. Um, now, when we step back and look at the sheep and the goats, we can see those differences, right? Likewise, we see differences with the spiritual sheep and the spiritual goats as well. There are differences between saved people and unsaved people. And I tell you, the, the, the things that a saved person is interested in is different than the things that an unsaved person is interested in. And one of the first ones, of course, is going to church. You know, uh, the unsaved says, well, what do I want to go to church for? The saved says, I want to go to church. The unsaved says, I don't want to go to church. The saved says, I want to read my Bible. The unsaved says, I don't want to read my Bible. What do I want that for? The saved says, I want to pray. I want to talk to Jesus. The unsaved says, ah, not me. You'll not catch me on my knees, boot licking. I'm not. And what good is prayer anyhow? It's not done anyone any good. Maybe a little yoga meditation is better. You'll see right away the differences between the spiritual sheep and the spiritual goats. Uh, not only are their interests level uh, different, their interests are different, their lifestyle is different as well. There's a story about a, an older Christian woman who was dying, and she was not quite sure if she was genuinely born again. And she called for her pastor, and her pastor came to visit her. And uh, he knew she was saved. There were so many evidences. And so uh, she expressed her doubts, you know, and I don't know for sure. Can you help me? And the pastor gently said to her, well, mom, he said, it wasn't his actual mother, right? He was just being loving and affectionate. He says, mom, he said, supposing that 
Across the street from your house, there were, there were two houses. In one house, they were having a party. They were drinking rum and whiskey, and they were maybe smoking and getting high, and they were, you know, boogieing, and they, they had the sound system going, and the tunes were going, and maybe even uh, a Swifty Taylor was going to visit that house, and, and everyone was just jumping with excitement. And then the next door, there was uh, a number of godly Christians singing some hymns and having a little Bible study, and they were going to have some prayer together. Mom, which of those two houses would you rather go to? And she says, oh, well, that's easy. I'd rather go to the house with the prayer meeting. And he pointed out to her, you see, that's evidence that you're saved. By the way, when I used that example, how many here were thinking, well, huh, no one's looking. I'd rather go see Swifty. Hmm. Yeah. I might tell you something, the difference between the sheep and the goats. Folks, I know we're using a little bit of humor, but we do have to be very serious when it comes to our eternity, because either you're saved and on your way to heaven, or you're lost and you'll open your eyes in hell one day. That's pretty serious. That's more serious than being told you have terminal cancer. Hmm? At least there's an end to that, but there is no end to an eternity in hell separated from God. That's why we're so passionate, we're so serious, we're so desirous, we're so prayerful that the whole world know how to be saved. Sadly, so many would prefer a worldly lifestyle. Their vocabulary as well. They have no problem taking the Lord's name in vain. Something goes on, the first thing they say is J.C. Or you hear the O.M.G. all the time. O.M.G., 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 and you'll hear it from kiddies as well, from children. Sadly, sometimes a Christian will utter things like that as well. That's not good. Well, you know, there's differences in behavior and so on. Now, something I found interesting when I did a little bit of research here is there are more physical goats in the world than there are physical sheep. Uh, the research I have done shows that there are almost one and a half billion, that's with a B, billion goats in the world, whereas there may be only one billion sheep in the world. So we can see that the goats outnumber the sheep. And what do we find between unsaved and saved? There's more unsaved in the world than there are saved. You know, the Lord Jesus, in Luke chapter 12, he talked about his sheep, and he called them the little flock. The little flock. You know, as if in comparison, you know, to the goats, the, the big flock. But Jesus had the little flock. Huh. It's interesting, isn't it? When Jesus looks at people, he knows if they're saved or lost. If Jesus stood in front of every one of us, he would know right away if we're born again and saved or if we're just a nice religious lost person. Say, how many nice religious lost people do you think there are in the world? Probably quite a few. That's my guess. But Jesus, when he looks at us, he knows if we're saved or if we're lost. Something else that Jesus also knows, and this is very important, and I don't want you to miss this. Jesus knows who of the lost will become saved. Now that's important. You remember earlier we said, where do sheep come from? And your answer was from sheep. Where do goats come from? Well, the answer is from goats. But the spiritual sheep, where do they come from? They come from the spiritual goats. You realize that if you're here today, you're born again, you're saved, there was a time in your life where you were lost. So if you're a spiritual sheep today, it means that there was a time in your past where you were a spiritual goat. You weren't saved. You weren't part of God's family. You weren't one of you know, the little flock. You were a goat. But somewhere along the line... You heard the gospel, you realized that Jesus saved sinners and you wanted him in your life to be your savior. 
And so you trusted him and you, you changed. You went from death unto life. You, you became a new creature. You went from being a goat to being one of these sheep. And I, I think that that's very important. I, I'd like you to take your Bible, please, and turn to the right to the Gospel of John. John chapter number 10. And what I want you to, to see here is this truth, and it's so important. That Jesus knows which of the lost will become saved. He knows that. He can see the future. And we see in John chapter 10, these wonderful words of Jesus in verse 26. And by the way, that's page 1112 in the church pew Bible, if you're using that. Verse 26, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. Now, obviously, Jesus is talking to some goats here, some spiritual goats. As I said unto you, verse 27, read this verse out loud, everyone, all together, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And so, here we can see definitely that there's a sheep and the non-sheep, the goats, and that Jesus knows. He knows. Now, turn again to the book of Acts. Turn to the right, not too far, Acts chapter number 18. That's page 1153 in the church Bible. Acts chapter 18. In Acts chapter 18, God was encouraging the Apostle Paul. Paul was at the city of Corinth, and he was very discouraged. He was trying to win people to Jesus and get a good church started. And he was discouraged. And so God encouraged Paul. And in verse 10, God said, For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. And so that encouraged Paul, and he stayed there, as you can see in the next verse, a year and six months, teaching the Word of God among them. And many people were saved. Now, when we look at people, we can't tell right away if they're saved or not. You know, that's just reality. And the best we can do is look at their lives. That's why you know, we want to get to know people before we take them into membership. That's why we do it. I know some churches, they'll just take in as many as they possibly can. And we don't do it that way. We like to know if a person is saved. And the only way you can do that is by fellowshipping with them over a period of time. That's the only way we can know. And we observe their lives. And if we sense a Christ-like spirit in them, then we conclude, oh, they must be saved. You know, they seem to smile at when we mention Jesus. They, they, they show a, an affection for uh, spiritual things, and they're looking forward to heaven, and they understand, you know, the nature of sin. They don't want to have anything to do with sin. And so these are some of the things we look for in a person's life, and it takes time, but Jesus doesn't have to take time. He knows right away if people are saved or, or if they're lost. Now, <clears throat> we, we know that some people are saved. The Bible also calls them sheep. But then there's one other word that the Bible uses in, in reference to these people that are saved. And that is the word, the elect. Elect. How many have ever heard that word before? Raise your hand if you've heard the word elect or election. Okay. Well, we want to talk about that for a few minutes, and we want to look at two or three scriptures on that. There's a lot of confusion out there on um, what this word means. The word elect literally means to pick or choose or select. That's all that the word means, to pick or choose or select. If you've ever gone to a restaurant and sat down and been handed a menu, what do you do? You look it over, and then you pick, or choose, or select. That's the election. Isn't that funny? Never thought of it that way, did we? 
that when we go into a restaurant, we are committing election. Maybe we commit a few other things as well. We overeat sometimes, but food is so good. But the word elect means to pick or to choose or to select. A couple uh, Bible verses I'll give you. You don't have to look them up. Romans 8.33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Here we have a verse that clearly indicates that saved people are the elect. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. These are things that the saved are to be put on we putting on and they are called the saved are being called the elect now something very 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 important you need to know about election when it comes to salvation election on god's part anyhow is based on foreknowledge that means to know something in advance and i want you to see that please turn in your bible to the book of first peter that's almost clean to the end of the new testament so turn to the right, go past Hebrews and James, and you'll find 1 Peter. That's going to be on page 1259 of the Church Bible. I want you to see this is very important truth. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Now, I just want you to read the very first portion of verse 2 out loud with me. 1 Peter 1, 2, let's read it together. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Stop right there. Elect, yeah, how so? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That means that God the Father had foreknowledge. He knew in advance something. And that's what I want you to get a hold of because... Truth is, there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to election. Election really is not that complicated. And I'm going to show that to you. I've been studying the subject of election since my days in Bible college in the 1970s. Um, I have uh, studied and spoken to people who believe that election happens only when you get saved. After you get saved, suddenly, somehow, you become the elect. That's their thinking. Uh, we have others who believe that God just arbitrarily picks this person and that person and this person and that one and this one over here, arbitrarily, for no apparent reason. Well, we say, what about these others? Well, some people say God elects them to go to hell. Others say, no, God just simply jumps over them. They'll end up in hell anyhow. So he's going to pick this person, jump over that person, pick this person, jump over that person, pick another. And these are typical theological concepts of election. But I believe that both are wrong because they're failing to take into account the nature of election. What does the word elect mean? What is it? To pick or to choose or to select. Say it again. Pick choose, select. That's what the word means. When we have a political election, when election time comes, we've got three or four or five candidates, right? You know, some men and women are all running to be mayor. They're all running to be, you know, prime minister. You've got these, these different people, and we call that the election. And it's supposed to be that the majority of the people you know, they figure out who's going to be picked because there's more picking picking person A than person B. And so the person A gets elected, we say. And we say, that's election. Yeah, that's true, but we're forgetting something. Because all those people running to be prime minister, all of them had to choose to run. We can't just go up to some man or woman on the street and say, we're picking you to be our prime minister. You have no say in the matter. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. You are it. That's not how it works. Uh, we can ask someone, would you like to run to be prime minister? And they may say, I would run away from being prime minister. 
And then someone else says, yes, I'll run. And then someone else says, yeah, I'll throw my hat in the ring. That's another way of saying I'll run. And another person says, say, yeah, count me in, I'll run. You see, what have they done? They have chosen. They have picked. They have selected. They have said, yes, I will run. So election is two sides of the street. Do we understand that? We cannot arbitrarily choose someone and put them in as our prime minister. It doesn't work that way. Kicking and screaming all the way, you know, to 24 Sussex. That's the residence of the prime minister, by the way. It doesn't work that way. People have free will. That's how we're made, folks. God has made us with free will. We can choose. We can pick. The word elect means to pick. Not only does God pick, but we pick also. It's a two-sided street. And once you understand that, you understand election. Because God chose us. He elected us according to his foreknowledge. His foreknowledge. Now, I know you can argue all day, well, what is that foreknowledge? Well, I think in simplistic terms, it's very simple. When presented with a choice, would you, would you run to be prime minister? With presented with that choice, you might say, yeah, I'll run to be prime minister. Or you might say, nah, I don't want that job. Pfft, too many headaches, heartaches, everyone putting a knife in your back. I don't want that job. And that's your pick. That's your choosing, right? We present the gospel to lost people. Would you like you know, to be saved, born again? Would you like Jesus in your heart? Some people are going to say, yeah, I would like that. Others are going to say, oh, I don't want that. I don't want that. No, count me out. Give it to Grandma. I don't want that. You see the difference? So election is a two-sided street. Both parties are involved in the picking. I suggest to you that God in his foreknowledge knew that at a certain point in your life, you'd want Jesus. Now the Bible teaches that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's all, everyone. That's God's desire. He's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance and be saved. That's what God wants. Sadly, that's not what everybody in the world wants. A lot of people want nothing to do with Jesus. But then there are people who really do want to be saved. And God, by his foreknowledge, even before the world began, he knew how many people are going to be in the world, what they're all about, what their name, their color, their eyes, and their hair, and so on. He knew everything about them. And he knew that at a certain point in their life, when presented with the invitation, they would say yes. And based on that, that's when God chose them. I'm going to give you a story that will help illustrate this. But before I do, I want you to see um, t turn back to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going, to, we're going to look at one or two more verses and then that's it. Okay, Back to the Gospel of Matthew. Now go to page 1016 in the uh, church Bible. Matthew chapter number 20. You know, this is a good subject that we're dealing with, folks, because I'll tell you right now, there is a growing, growing movement uh, called Calvinism. And there's different levels of Calvinism. There's five points of Calvinism. Not all Calvinists hold five points. Some are four-pointers, some are three-pointers, some are two-pointers, some are one-pointer. They still call themselves Calvinists. You get five Calvinists in a room, you'll have six or seven different opinions. That's just the way it is. But um, one of the, 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 the principal beliefs of, a, of Calvinists is that God has arbitrarily picked who is going to be saved. Whether they want it or not, they're going to be picked. You know? And then they've got other theological ideas that God, well, God will make them happy. God, you know, sort of thing. And Again, I reject that because it's, it's, it's one-sided street. They totally ignore man's free will. 
So what a lot of Calvinists do is they play, they have to, they play with a few words in the Bible. You know, for example, John 3.16, you all know that one? Say it with me if you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, the Calvinists don't believe that Jesus died for the whole world. They only believe that Jesus died for the elect. And so, in their minds, they have to change John 3.16 into something like this. For God so loved the world of the elect that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever of the elect believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. That's what they have to do. And that verse that says, God is not willing that any should perish, they have to do a little massage on that. God is not willing that any of the elect shall perish. You might think this is games. You'd be right. <laughs> But that's the kind of games they have to play. They can't take the scripture as it, as it is. They have to always be saying, well, I know it says all, but it doesn't mean all. Now, I want you to see in Matthew chapter 20, and go to verse 28. You see, it says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, now watch these next words, and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, the Calvinists jump on that, and they say, see that? It doesn't say all, to give his life a ransom for all. It says, for many. Not all, but many. You see that proof right there? Jesus didn't die for all. He died just for the many, the elect. That's how they do it. Now, we're in the very same chapter here. Uh, and I want you to go to verse 16 of this very same chapter. And you'll see again the words of, uh, of the Lord Jesus. He says in verse 16, So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. What do they do with that? Uh oh, it's the same word many. And if you look at verse 15, uh, sorry, verse 16, it seems to indicate that everyone's being called, but only a few are being chosen. And you go down to verse 28, and they say, oh, well, he gave his life a ransom for many, not for all, but for many. And they have a problem with those two verses. And I'll tell you something. The word many can mean all. You say... How is that, Pastor? How is it that many can mean all? Oh, I'll tell you. Supposing that everyone connected with our church were here today. Now they're not. We're missing a whole bunch of folks today. Okay? It's hard to get everyone into church at one time. You know, throughout the course of the year, you know, everyone comes through the church. But to try and get everyone in the church at the same time Man, we'd have, I don't know, 250 people or something like that. There'd be a lot of people. But here's my point. If we had everyone currently connected with Grace Baptist Church here in the church, we'd have a lot of people, wouldn't we? You'd agree with that. We could say there were many in church today. There were many people in church today. You could say that and be right. And you could also say, they were all in church today. And you'd be right. How many people in the world today, approximately? What is it? Eight billion. Eight billion. Would you say that's a lot of people? Yes? Would you say that's many people? Sure. You could also say it's all the people. And you'd be right. You'd be right both times. God is not willing that any should perish. And Jesus died for the whole world. Everyone. No one is ever going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment, dividing the sheep and the goats. None of those goats are ever going to say, now, now wait right there, sir. Wait right there. If you had died for me, then I would be saved. I don't deserve to go to hell. 
You only died for those sheep. You didn't die for us. But if you had died for us, if you had died for me, I would have been saved. That's a pretty good argument. But no one's going to have that argument because when Jesus died on the cross, he died for the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future. You may not understand how he was able to do that. Maybe in eternity in heaven we'll find out. It's just a little bit beyond our thinking, folks, but God is a little bit beyond our thinking too. Would you agree? And he's able to do things that we can't do. When Jesus died on the cross, when he shed his blood, he made one-time ransom payment available for the whole world. It's estimated that from Adam until today, there's been something like 14 billion people born and there's only 8 billion left. <laughs> it's funny to think of it that way. Jesus died for all 14 billion. Not just the, the few elect. No one will ever be able to say, I don't deserve to be in hell. You didn't die for me. Jesus, if you had shed even one drop of blood for me, I'd be over there in heaven. It doesn't work that way. He died for all. He's not willing that any should perish. If a, if a man is, is dying, but if he repents and believes on Christ before he dies, he will be saved. That's the promise of Almighty God. Salvation is a gift given when we repent and believe in Christ. Now to repent, you must first understand that you've done something you shouldn't have done. And you have. It's called sin. S-I-N. All kinds of it. Sins of the mind. Sins of the ears. Sins of the eyes. Sins of the hand. Sins of the foot. You've gone places. You've done things. You've broken promises. You've said wordy dirds. And you've taken the Lord's name. And you've you know, done this and that. And it's a life full of disobedience and sin. And all that needs to be paid for. And the blood of Christ is able to wash every sin. You know... We stand cleansed before God, clothed in the robes of righteousness of Jesus Christ. Only God could do that. Hallelujah. You see the difference between the sheep and the goats. You're here today, you're either a sheep or you're a goat. The good news is that if you're a goat, you can become a sheep by repenting of your sin, trusting in Christ. I, I mentioned earlier, I'm going to tell you a little story. And it's a true story. How many have ever uh, been in, in the United States and gone to a J.C. Penney store? Put up your hand. Oh, there's a few of us. Yeah, okay. J.C. Penney. Famous, right? Famous store. And uh, I got a picture. Put that picture up. All right. Now you're looking at the life of Mr. J.C. Penney. And I don't have to say this, but he was a little boy in this picture. And he was an old man in this picture. Something, though, I do want to get your opinion is this picture here. If you took the mustache off him and put glasses on him, do you think that would look like Pastor uh, Ivan? <laughs> he and I were talking about this. He doesn't think it looks anything like him. I don't know. But um, if, it, if it does then Pastor Ivan, when you get older, I'll give you maybe a hint. But uh, he, was, he died a very wealthy man too. And he was a, a Christian man as well, J.C. Penney. Um, the J.C. stands for James Cash. What an interesting name. And his last name, Penny. <laughs> James Cash Penny, uh, Jr. So that must mean there was what? A... Uh, Senior, yeah. And hey, if it worked for dad, it'll work for, for his boy. So there's J.C. Penny Jr. He was born 1875. He died 1971. He was an American businessman and an entrepreneur. And in 1902, I guess he would have been 27, something like that. That's when he started the J.C. Penny stores. Amazing. He became a very successful businessman. And he was always looking to hire on good people. Now, here's my point. Listen carefully to this, because this will help you to understand election. Listen carefully. 
J.C. Penney was always looking to hire on good men, faithful men, hardworking men, honest men. That's what he was always looking for. And so what he would do is he would interview them, bring them into his office, and the first thing he would tell them is that they must work long hours for very little pay. That's the first thing he would tell them. But he would tell them this, if you can do that, then you will rise up the ladder and one day you will be a part owner of this company. Many men who came to Mr. Penny for a job and were, were told this, they had to work long hours for very little pay. They left his office very discouraged, never to return. But some men said, that's okay, Mr. Penny. That's okay if what you say is true and I'll rise up the ladder one day and one day I'll be a part owner of this company. I'm in. They kept their eyes on the final goal. And what happened? Each and every one became financially prosperous businessmen. Now, Mr. Penny made his offer to all the men who came in his office looking for work. But only a few of them seemed to want the job. Do you understand that? That's pretty simple. And it was these men that Mr. Penny chose. He chose them after they chose the job. Does that make sense? Now what if, what if Mr. Penny had the ability to know in advance which of those men was going to choose the job? What if Mr. Penny knew he had foreknowledge of who was going to want the job? Well, then he could have chosen them with his foreknowledge. Couldn't he? And that gives you an idea of election. And God in his foreknowledge knew that a young teenage boy back in 1975 was going to come to a point in his life where he said, you know, God, uh, I want you. I need you. Would you forgive me my sin? I've made shipwreck. Would you be my Savior? Would you be my Lord? And he knew that I was going to get on my knees on April the 6th, 1975, and ask him to be my Savior. And he knew that in advance. Because of that, he chose me. Now I ask you today, are you a sheep or a goat? And if you're a goat, don't be ashamed, but don't stay that way. You can become one of God's sheep today. May 26, 2024 can be the day you become a new creature in Christ. Today can be the day when you leave the old life behind with its sin and its depravity and its addictions. You leave it behind and you step out of that. You leave behind your filthy garments of self-righteousness and sin. And you put on the glistening, gleaming white robes of Jesus Christ. You stand redeemed. Just like the choir sang. That can be yours. Would you bow your head and close your eyes, please? Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.